Good morning, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Hennoja Ojaver, and I'm Estonian member to ICS Science Committee. Uh, I will briefly introduce you today to the, today's uh, keynote speaker, who is Professor Chad Hewitt from New Zealand. He is currently the dean of the uh, School of Science at the University of Waikato, and uh, his research excellence in marine science can be captured into basically into three generic keywords, marine biological invasions, risk assessments, and biosecurity management. He has previously worked uh, for what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as he, he was previously worked for this uh, Central Queensland University in, in Australia as Pro Vice Rector for Research. He, he was also employed by the New Zealand government as a chief officer in marine biosecurity and also worked for uh, Australian CSIRO in marine research for the research center on introduced marine pests. So in addition, in, 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 uh, in addition to his uh, research interest and research career, he is also currently advising the Australian government on risk assessments. So, Chad, the floor is yours, and we will uh, close sharply at 9.30, so please. I'm not sure if that was a warning or an ad admonition. Um, I'd like to thank the ICES conference organizers, and specifically um, the Science Committee and HEN, for inviting me to come and share my, uh, my experience, my learnings with you. Um, I'd also like to, um, to some extent, give an homage to ICES in its, um, its forward thinking when it established the Working Group on Introductions and tra of Transfers in, of Marine Organisms. Um, Wajitmo and then subsequently the Working Group on Ballast and Other Shipping Vectors have played a significant role in our current understanding, our global understanding, but also our current management regimes, and I'll highlight a few of those as we go through. Um, of course, we live in a hyper-connected world. We like to be hyper-connected. Um, and as you can see from the image here, which is basically scaled according to the, the time of travel, um, much of this is trade-related, but it's also conference-related, obviously. Um, now, Biological introductions, or the, uh, the discipline of uh, invasion ecology, wouldn't be a discipline if it didn't have its own lexicon and jargon. So I'm going to go through a few of the elements. Um, we're all familiar with colonization process and the creation of a patch. And over the time scales of minutes to weeks to months, um, possibly even years, a colonization event occurs where individual propagules arrive at the location and settle. Similarly, these spatial scales tend to be from millimeters to, to hundreds, maybe thousands of kilometers in terms of where those pop propagules start and end up. Now, biological invasions, and these are the natural invasions that occur, tend to be between adjacent uh, bio, biological provinces. These adjacencies typically result in the breakdown of biogeographic barriers, um, often on geologic timescales and often at spatial scales that are in thousands and potentially, um, you know, several thousands of kilometers. Occasionally, um, and some of you have worked on these elements, you will see groups of species rafted from one location to another or transferred from one location to another. But typically, these are individual species events. Now, marine introductions, that is, the human-mediated movements of species, transcend the biogeographic provinces, the biological invasions that we've looked at previously, by orders of magnitude. Um, they connect parts of the world that have no logical mechanism for relationship. And they do so at timescales equivalent to colonization processes. So in fact, we're seeing the movements of species, not just as individuals, but at times as whole communities 
between disparate regions of the world in the timescales of weeks, maybe months. So the lexicon that we've talked about, we have introduced species, of course, alien, exotic, non-indigenous, non-native, um, it goes on. Cryptogenic species, or those species that have hidden origin, ones that we cannot ascertain where their original evolutionary history comes from. Vectors, um, the mechanisms of transport between one location and another. Pathways, the connections between two points, so a link between nodes if, uh, if you're a network person. Now, I would like to point out that vector and pathway are used in marine introduction ecology in a very different fashion from terrestrial quarantine or terrestrial invasion ecology. They actually switch those around. Um, kind of confusing when you try and talk to your colleagues. And then biosecurity is the biological security of, uh, of managing non-native species or invasions. It was originally coined in New Zealand um, in the mid-80s. It resulted in the Biosecurity Act in 90, 1993. And then it's been hijacked post 9-11 by North Americans for little white powders. So we now have um, two different definitions, but um, biosecurity is by and large used to define the, the introductions of species. So marine bioinvasions is relatively recent in terms of its awareness in, in the public and as a consequence awareness in management. Our responses have almost significantly been dictated by key species that have arrived um, and then caused either impacts to values that we have, predominantly economic, um, or in the case of harmful algal blooms, human morbidity and mortality. So the opportunities to respond to these things have only arisen since the late 80s and then subsequently into the 90s. Similarly, as we've started to investigate, we've actually found that there's this super acceleration. And that super acceleration that was initially defined for San Francisco Bay by Jim Carlton um, has subsequently been detected in many other parts of the world. The UK, of course, stopped counting after 50, so that's why it, it doesn't super accelerate there. So some of the questions that have been asked recently um, and specifically by managers is why should we do this? Um, now obviously we have a philosophy of responsibility. Um, there is a sense that we have created the problem. As a consequence, we should do something about it. That philosophy of responsibility only goes so far, however, and as a consequence, it becomes quite transactional. We are concerned with those species that impact on values. Our definition of values is um, variable. Obviously, it varies between nations, um, but it also varies between sectors of society. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in typical fashion, it is predominantly focused on the economic impacts, those elements that affect our livelihood or those elements that are affect our health and well-being. And then lastly, and I'll explore this at the very end, is the learning opportunities that biological invasions and biological introductions represent. Introductions are large-scale experiments. They are, unfortunately, or in some instances, they are replicated, but we try and prevent that from happening. Um, they are a learning opportunity in terms of a changing world, and we'll discuss that in, uh, in short form. So recently, there's been a discourse where several authors have suggested that we shouldn't really pay attention to all the species that, after all, the vast majority of them don't cause problems. Um, we should only manage those species for which impact is either demonstrable, where sufficient information is available to warrant action, or where the management action is likely to result in positive outcomes. Now, this on face value sounds great. It is been an argument put forward by many of our terrestrial colleagues where the knowledge base is sufficient to uh, potentially be able to predict and manage those species. However, the position's been countered by a number of invasion ecologists, including many terrestrial ecologists, where the, demonst the demonstration of impact is often too late to actually respond in a timely fashion. And as a consequence, not only do we not respond, 
but where we do respond, it's deemed to be a waste of public monies. And this is particularly relevant in marine ecosystems where our detection ability is low, where our ability, our toolbox to be able to do something about it is low, and as a consequence, we oftentimes need to focus more on precaution, on prevention, rather than focus on cure. So, as I said, the supporting knowledge base is poor, and that's going to take up um, a fair amount of the, the talk in terms of discussing that. But I'd also like to point out that um, there is a, uh, shall we say, a defeatist attitude that exists. Um, the problem is frequently perceived to be too big, and as a consequence, uh, we're, we're stuck as, um, what is it, a stunned mullet. We, we don't know what to do, and as a consequence, we don't do anything. Um, so the, fo the focus on prevention and risk reduction is also related to our ability to do something. It becomes tractable. We can be seen to be having action and effect. So many of the questions that are asked at this point in time are around species of concern, the vectors that are important in the pathways, and as a consequence of that poor data knowledge, it, we then focus on risk management, risk mitigation. So, you know, just to recap on what is the risk process, we're probably all familiar or intimately familiar with various versions of this, but essentially you identify the endpoint you wish to achieve, you identify the hazards that are likely to, uh, to manifest, you look at the consequence of those hazards, should they manifest, you look at the likelihood, and then you calculate risk, and hopefully, once you've communicated that risk, you are able to manage it. We do this in the context of the invasion process, which again is very simple and, um, well, it's simple in a diagram, it's not simple in reality. So if we start thinking about it, hazard analysis is species-based. Species cause harm, not the vectors, not the pathways, those are the mechanisms by which species arrive, but the species are the ones that actually create the problem. Now most of these are on the basis of uptake, but very clearly, despite the fact that they may arrive in a new location, oftentimes they may not establish. And being able to predict which species will arrive is one thing. Being able to then subsequently predict establishment is another. So how many species are currently in play? And um, the search for suspects, we, we have a number of ways of doing it. Um, it is not easy to identify what is introduced versus what is not, hence the term cryptogenic. Um, they don't come with tags, unfortunately, and it means you do have to forensically determine whether or not it belongs in a new location. Um, we can obviously get on to those vectors and sample what is there to determine who's arriving in new locations, and we've done a fair amount of that, both with ballast water as well as biofouling. Or we can undertake targeted assessments in specific locations to be able to identify, and I'll talk to both of those. The global assessment um, that was undertaken uh, in preparation for advice to Australia looked at literature up until 2012. Um, it was a fairly daunting task. We assigned those species to a suite of, of bioregions. Um, which bioregionalization you use, you can appreciate. Um, is a, a matter of lengthy discussion. We chose the IUCN bioregions. They roughly align to provincial um, breakages. And we assigned those species um, both in terms of native, cryptogenic, and introduced status. Um, a thousand data sources uh, were identified, and um, the estimate that we ended up with was about 2,400 species. Um, we actually know that's inaccurate, we're currently at around 2,700 a few years later. Um, and these are only the species that are recognized and declared as non-native. These are the ones that some researcher somewhere has put their hand on their heart and said, yes, this is not, um, not something that belongs here. If we look at that global assessment, it covers 35 phyla. Um, 14 of which represent about 95% of the total. Um, and crustaceans, mollusks, chordates, the ones, the, the high value suspects are the ones that we would expect to be there. Um, interestingly, the differentiation for chordates between ascidians and fishes 
is quite significant. Ascidians are overrepresented in, in that system. And more importantly, all large-scale IUCN bioregions, including the Antarctic and the Arctic regions, have recognized invasions. 47% of those invasions are found um, in the Mediterranean. Many of those are Lesepsian movements through the Suez Canal. And then Australia and New Zealand, which may be a search effort issue, as you'll see. And a complicated slide for Alistair. He, uh, he wanted one. So um, the key here is that, uh, I mean, obviously, everything's connected. But the key behind this circus plot is you can actually start to see who contributes species to other regions and who is a receiver. And you can see that the Mediterranean, by far and away, is the receiving region, not the donor region. Whereas other places like the Northwest Pacific, so Japan, China, Korea, the East Asian seas and the Arabian seas are significant donors, but not necessarily recipients. Some of those differentiations may in fact be because we have poor knowledge base about receiving, so they don't know how many species they have, but other locations can recognize species coming from those locations. In Australia, we were concerned about the scale and the scope of invasion, so we undertook a, a suite of port surveys. Um, interesting environments to dive in, interesting visibility. Um, this is not a uh, typical image from a port environment. We designed a suite of sampling protocols and then undertook the evaluation. Before I arrived in Australia, um, we knew that there were 62 species. These were the recognized ones that had been acknowledged and identified. By the time we finished the port surveys, we knew that there were 629 species. 248 of those were novel um, uh, identifications through the port survey program. And you can see that there's a significant latitudinal gradient from tropical systems having very few uh, invasions, temperate systems having a significant number. And of course, Port Phillip Bay, which is right there, is actually a, a very large number because of the, long, the longevity of trading history, both with Europe and other parts of the world. Now, the tropical absence is an interesting one, and it's correlated with our taxonomic uncertainty. Um, in tropical systems, the proportion of, of surveyed species, the proportion of biodiversity, for which we have no Latin binomial is quite significant. Realistically, these are all cryptogenic species, um, although that argument with my taxonomic colleagues um, was a significant, long, and drawn out one. Um, as far as they're concerned, it's native, because that's their biogeographic bias until we can demonstrably prove that it doesn't belong there. If we use this example of the difference between 1990 and 2010 as an, a, a method to estimate how much our knowledge gain um, from those surveys has occurred, we can see that um, we're an order of magnitude difference in the number of species, but even more importantly, we're differentially across those, those various taxa. So arthropods and mollusks, um, there were substantive gains, but really the, the ectoprox, the nidarians, um, the, some, of the, uh, some of the algae were just completely unknown pre-1990 and, and we now have a demonstrable element. So that 25, 2700 species from a global estimate may in fact represent 25,000 or even 250,000 potentially. Our global understanding of the distribution of species <clears throat> is also very interesting. 70% are actually only known from one region, and many of those are actually high impact invasions like Potamocorbula amurensis, or Corbula amurensis as it is now, in San Francisco Bay, and the Northern Pacific Sea Star, Asterius amurensis, only known from Tasmania and Victoria in Australia. <clears throat> However, some other high-profile invasions also have moderately restricted distribution. And then there are a few, less than 1.1%, uh, 
that are known to be introduced to a wider variety of locations. Interestingly, both of these are older invasions, Carcinus manus, that I'm sure many of you in the audience rep, uh, recognize, and Bugula narratina, again, both European invaders of most of parts of the rest of the world. If we also look at the age difference of invasions, this was a piece of work that Jeb Byers and colleagues um, undertook. We can see that older invasions in blue have a wider um, spread or distribution in terms of modern context, as opposed to recent invasions, which are, of course, 1954 uh, to present. Both uh, North America, Australia, we also did a few other locations, and the pattern consistently came forward. So if we look at this, the years since first record of invasion is, is a predictor of the non-native distributional range. Now the question is, what does this mean? Is this actually the, uh, the indication of spread? Is this the recognition that a species is introduced and therefore now we're finding it in more places? Or is this actually, it began to participate in the invasion process and so the vector that moved it around was available to move it further? So a lot more work for you undergraduates and postgraduates in the audience um, to be done in this space. <clears throat> so in quick summary, um, global estimate probably around 24, 25,000 um, or 24, 2500. Uh, all regions are invaded with strong differences and there's a continued potential for spread, especially of our high profile very high impact species. In undertaking a consequence assessment, of course, the question becomes, what do we want to protect? Um, now, this is a, both an ecological but also a socio-political decision. And I think some of the talks that I've heard over the last few days and anticipate in, in the next few days, um, we are seeing this this development of an understanding of what do we value and why do we wish to protect those elements. If we choose a quarantine endpoint, then all species cause impact, and it may be that all species, therefore, are what we wish to protect against. So the questions around what constitutes impact, how do we categorize those, how do we metricize them, and therefore communicate to our political stakeholders, and then how do we measure them in the field are critical to understanding this. Recently, two impact schemes have been put forward into the literature, one by Blackburn and colleagues, um, largely using terrestrial examples. And they suggest that a classification scheme should be based on how species cause impact. So what we would typically think of as a, a trait-based um, focus. Uh, with HEN, we've published a counter uh, schema which focuses on marine examples, and there we're interested very much in the values that are impacted. So what are the impacts in terms of what we wish to protect? So I'll just quickly kind of talk to two of these, uh, these two schemes. Um, Blackburn's classification was divided into trophic categories. Uh, you're a predator, therefore you impact on things because you eat them. Um, you're an herbivore, you impact on things because you eat them. Um, you're a pathogen, you impact on things because you make it sick. Uh, those elements and the scales of impact were literally based on individuals to populations to communities. So the scalers were on the basis of those relationships. Um, the absence of knowledge in their system removes a species from further evaluation. So it gets set aside in the hope that at some point in the future, as knowledge acquisition occurs, it will be brought back in. Um, and of course, you know, reflecting on my own publications over the years, this is how I've categorized species. When I talk to my colleague scientists, this is what I say. You know, these many were predators, these many were herbivores. The Ogevere et al. classification focused on the, the value categorizations in environmental, economic, social, and cultural. Um, and these were developed in consultation with, um, with political stakeholders, with regulators. The scales of impact increase along a suite of dimensions from no discernible impact to extreme, which may result in irreversibility. And I'll talk to some of the sub-elements that we looked at. <clears throat> 
The absence of knowledge is, um, is critical here. A precautionary approach would dictate that the absence of knowledge makes that species um, likely to have a high impact or a high consequence. Now, we believe this is highly relevant to managers and stakeholders, but in fact, it may be less relevant, relevant to researchers other than in that applied context. So those, um, those exemplars that we have developed to try and help people understand the scales of impact start to look at the dimensions within each of those value categories. So, you know, for example, environmental values, we would look at the scale of impact um, at the local scale, so the percentage of that value that is affected. Um, the geopolitical scale, does it transcend boundaries? Does it become a transnational issue that suddenly brings into play a suite of treaties or um, relationships? Uh, the proportion of value that is affected in a global context and the anticipated resilience. Do we believe that if the introduced species were removed, we would actually have recovery of the system or have we seen a, a regime shift in that time? Now, obviously it suffers from the availability of information and in fact, our ability to engage in the discussion around impact is critically hampered by this lack of knowledge. The Australian biofouling risk assessment um, that we performed for um, the Australian government, we considered around 700 species. 71% of them had no published information on impact available for us to, to look at. Of that, of the remaining 200 species where impacts were, um, were present in the literature, 60% of them were inferred from the opinion of the researcher or the author. So that evidentiary data was actually quite, um, quite sparse. If we look at macroalgal invasions, 80% um, of 300 species that we investigated had no available information on impact. So we're starting to, to see a picture here that we're, we have a, a very significant knowledge gap in this space. Now, typically in the absence of knowledge, one thing that you would do is you'd go to your experts and you'd ask, what's your opinion on this? So we were interested in whether scientists and managers would take a differential approach, whether in the presence of uncertainty, scientists would be precautionary in their approach and indicate that I don't know, therefore the probability or the way we have to treat this is that it has a high consequence, as opposed to managers who have an economic and political incentive to be careful. Um, and be non-precautionary. Now, we did this both in the US and Australia. I'm sorry to say that all of us were very non-precautionary. All of us, in the presence of high uncertainty, chose to deem that species to have low impact. So I think this has implications in terms of how we consider um, the information flow and what is going forward, especially in the face of what essentially is an agreement that we will be precautionary in how we manage environments. And in addition to that, and I think this is something that we've only recently started to explore, is um, the statistical bias that we um, employ. We make the assumption that species are innocent until we can prove them guilty. Our hypothesis, our frequentist statistical approach, says that we will intentionally not deem impact unless we can prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, shadow of a doubt evidently is an alpha of 0.05. So the evaluate, we, we took a look at um, 31 non-significant empirical evaluations for both algal and crustaceans. So these are ones where people went out, they did a fantastic statistical design as far as we could tell, they sampled, they found no impact. Unfortunately, 97% of those analyses had insufficient power to detect impact even if it exi existed. Now, the difficulty with that is it's fine in the scientific literature. We understand those biases. In most of those instances, they weren't reported, but that's fine. The unfortunate element is that the manager, or even more importantly, the politician, will say that the no evidence of impact is equivalent to no impact. And I think we need to be very careful about how we communicate this into the future. Um, so we've done with species. Uh, how did the species get here? 
um, what is the, the likelihood of, tra of transport. So which transport vectors and which pathways are most important becomes the question and focus of interest. Um, now, a variety of transport vectors exist, and you're probably all familiar with them. Intentional transport associated with aquaculture, aquarium trade, fishery stocking, live seafood movements, unintentional transport specifically associated with vessels, and then the hitchhikers associated with aquaculture and packing materials. If we look at the life history characteristics of those 2,500 or so species, we can see that a very significant number of them are associated with vessel movements. And as a consequence, we've had a very significant focus on how we manage vessels into the future. Ballast water, um, we can almost tick off on this, but just to kind of sum up, three to 10 billion tons of ballast water is being transferred globally um, each year. Most of that ballast water is derived from coastal environments and discharged into coastal environments. We do have ballast exchange at sea, but we currently have somewhere between 70 and 90% compliance. We estimate that somewhere around 7,000 species are in movement, in transit, at any one, in, one point in time. And the current global feet, fleet of around 200,000 vessels, half the time they're in ballast. Now just a, a quick summary. Um, this is really restricted to commercial vessels, um, including passenger vessels. Um, we really don't know much about naval vessels. They're usually excluded from uh, reporting responsibility. In the late 19th century, when we shifted from wooden vessels to steel hulled vessels and we developed pump systems, that's really when ballast water became an issue. So we're talking 18, 1860s, 1890s, um, and continued on. It is critical to vessel operations. It maintains the trim and, uh, trim and stability of vessels um, when they're without cargo. <clears throat> and it basically allows them some level of steerage and propulsion. Um, now, as I said, only a portion of vessels, um, arriving vessels, are in ballast. And it, dif it's differential whether you're a trading um, contributor or whether you're a receiver of goods. Now, this has been um, seen as a greenfield's activity. The solution is technological. Um, it's an engineering solution. Surely we can fix this. I think one of the most common comments is, why don't we just chlorinate it? Um, of course, you have to discharge that water somewhere. Um, and the volume chlorine that we'd have to generate is, is quite significant. So the IMO Ballast Water Convention is a focus on a shift from exchange at sea, where we take coastal plankton and leave them in the desert of the open ocean, and we take open ocean species and we bring them into the coast to a treatment standard. And this has been the, the challenge that we've posed to the industry for the last um, decade. Now, I'm happy to say with the accession of Finland, um, the Ballast Water Convention will enter into force on the 8th of September, 2017. Um, it has been a long and hard, arduous trial um, to get there. The timeline has been um, the initial IMO assembly resolution in 1986 to 2017. And I, I just want to point out that Wujitmo and the working group on ballast and other shipping vectors has had a very substantive play in providing vi advice both to member states as well as directly to the IMO secretariat on aspects associated with the implementation. Now, there's a lot of work to do. But to some extent, we can put a big tick on this one and say, we achieved something. Vessel biofouling, on the other hand, is a more insidious and a longer standing threat. Um, biofouling basically is on any wetted surface that exists in the, um, in the sea. And if you think about it, um, it includes not just the exposed external surfaces of vessels, but also all of the internal piping and the tanks. Um, Regardless of whether the vessel is transporting goods or is without goods, it'll have biofouling. It will gain biofouling the minute it leaves dry dock. It will continue to accumulate species at each location that it arrives. So it's a concatenation, if you will, of all of the sampled areas that it, it goes to. Um, Again, um, it's under IMO consideration. We're probably starting that process from, we're 1986. 
we're about to move into um, an assembly resolution. Guidelines are being drafted. And again, Wijitmo and uh, Ballast and other shipping vectors are making significant contributions into that discussion. Um, I went to the microplastics discussion yesterday, which was, uh, was really fascinating, and heard one of the talks here in the Baltic talk about paint chips as microplastics. Of course, one of our key tools in managing biofouling is in-water cleaning, which generates these paint chips. Um, so it's going to be an interesting interplay between which values we wish to protect and what mechanisms we put in play to, uh, to manage those. What's the size of the problem? So this is an, the average wetted surface area per vessel by vessel type, but I'd, I'd like you to look at, at this one. Two times the city of Riga is being moved. It's a, we have a fouling panel of 570 square kilometers that's moving around the ocean every day. And that is a phenomenal number. Many of these species are isolated to hydrodynamically protected areas. Um, so that 570 kilometers square can probably be reduced down maybe an order of magnitude. It's only, you know, 57 square kilometers. Um, and if you look at these niche areas, you can see that in a sampling of about 300 vessels in New Zealand, 90% of detected species were present in those niche areas, and specifically in the areas of thrusters, gratings, rudders, and um, propeller shafts. So we look, we can see, we can identify where these species are likely to be, and we can begin a process. Now, of course, passenger and fishing vessels, which are much slower and probably have less hull husbandry obligations, um, you have a much wider uh, distribution of species in those vessels. And then uh, it would be remiss of me at, at ICES not to talk to aquaculture. Um, aquaculture introductions, and especially hitchhikers, are largely historic at this point. Um, there are some targeted introductions of intentional species. But the Best practice, the modern best practice, has been quite significantly influenced by the ICES Code of Practice. Um, again, that contribution has influenced both the tenor and the tone um, in Europe, but also um, globally. And of course, as we see this increase in aquaculture production and the desire for food from the sea, we will see an increase in aquaculture, and therefore this is a, a, a watching state. We believe this this will become something that we have to pay more attention to into the future. Now, the pathways or the trade routes have substantively changed through time. Um, we now are in this hyper-connected context where the trade routes and the connectivity between locations are significant. But a changing world means that there are the significant potentials for changing trade routes as well. And I know that ICES is paying attention to the the Arctic um, a possibility for transshipment. Um, now this has two influences. Not only does it expose these pristine or moderately pristine environments to novel invasions, but there will be a creation of infrastructure in these locations as well as a reduction of time for transit between what were previously connections that required either longer time periods or went through the Panama Canal and therefore exposure to fresh water. The distribution of non-native species based on survey data, where we actually can, can say the amount of effort and, and therefore the number of species are well recognized, is very much a temperate distribution. We know that the native distribution of diversity in the oceans um, has a peak at the tropics and tails off at high latitudes. But the question for invasions is, is this an absence of looking? Is this an absence of opportunity? Or in re reality, is this the gap where we may see future invasions? So as Eva indicated, we live in an Anthropocene ocean. Um, we're inducing and also witnessing the induction of a large number of changes. Introduced species and our study of how introductions insinuate themselves into communities and interact in these novel relationships 
may help us understand and predict some of these other elements. Trophic shifts um, obviously are being created both intentionally and unintentionally. Increasing urbanization on a global basis is creating more habitat that is not natural. And of course, we know that non-native species love urban habitat. And then climate-associated rain shifts where species are moving at differential rates that result in novel combinations of species. The, the early arrivers as opposed to the late arrivers are interacting with what were the laggers in, um, in their higher latitudes are going to provide us the opportunity to ask questions around how these species assemble. But even more importantly, the desire for us to do something is likely to lead to assisted colonization activity where we will pick up entire reef systems and move them to novel locations. These novel combinations of species and their interactions in these new environments are critically going to be ostensibly biological introductions. And so our understanding of how invaders interact with new communities is going to help us understand and plan for these assisted colonization events. So our conclusions, but more importantly, our needs. Um, we know that introductions are underestimated and they're underestimated in a wide variety of elements of the world. Um, we currently know that 91% of species in the marine environment are undescribed and our ability to determine native non-native status is reliant on that uh, understanding. There is a tyranny of the small. Small things in the past we thought they had no biogeography, now we know they do, but we still ignore them because they're hard. Um, and there's a bias in many of the existing taxonomists and biogeographers of an assumption towards native. So being able to establish a greater understanding and suspending this disbelief is critical. So while surveys are perceived to be expensive, they're actually quite critical in terms of our ability to manage these locations. I do like, you know, despite looking at this for multiple weeks, I uh, miss that A. Um, the impact, um, my personal feeling is that we're now at the point where understanding impact and being able to predict impact is critical to the dialogue with um, political stakeholders and with the public. Now, this bias towards innocent until proven guilty is something that we all have to tackle and especially we have to tackle as researchers. Um, while there are several ways to categorize impact, the reality is they're data onerous. And so we need to be really clear, clear about what effect size we're trying to detect. And to do that, we have to have dialogue with both our stakeholders as well as ourselves around what is an acceptable impact as opposed to what is not. And that will determine the type of research that we do. No impact does not equal um, negligible impact. No detected impact does not equal no impact. We need to be very careful about the disincentives for knowledge acquisition and investment. If we don't look, we don't find, we don't have to manage. That is a very slippery slope. And then lastly, um, global collaboration networks are necessary. I want to know if the species you have that may arrive in New Zealand causes harm. You have to do the research. I can't do it and vice versa, we need that reciprocity. So I'd like to thank um, or acknowledge a number of uh, participants. My wife, Marnie Campbell, and I um, collaborate quite significantly. A couple of our students, um, Jim is, um, he's, he's always someone you can go to and ask, do you know this species? And he'll tell you the entire history, it takes a few hours. Um, <laughs> Greg Ruiz at um, Cirque and of course my colleagues, um, former colleagues at CSIRO, and then as I said, um, ICES, Wajitmo, and um, the working group on ballast and other shipping vectors has been a fantastic forum to bounce ideas from the southern hemisphere in um, a northern hemisphere context. And then a number of, um, of political stakeholders and funding agencies um, that have supported this work. So thank you. Thank you. We have uh, sufficient time for questions. So.
Are there any questions? Thanks. If no one else is going to ask, I might as well ask something. So you talked a little bit about um, the statistics and the frequentist and the 95% confidence interval and so forth. And it would seem that one could turn that around into like risk and calculation of a probability of being above or below. But you didn't talk about the solution part. I mean, you have solutions in mind with regard to how to get this that. Is, this is the frustration, isn't it? We've talked about this for 20 years. Um, we acknowledge the bias that, they, that we have to non-assigning impact. Um, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, introduced species don't belong there. They cause impact. The question isn't, do they cause impact? The question is, do they cause unacceptable impact? And I think that's the, the shift in thinking. Now, obviously, Bayes' theorem allows us a lot more opportunity. Um, and as you said, risk is, is critically the element. The consequence framework that we've put forward in terms of the values, we believe can easily translate into effect size discussions. And I think that's the, the, uh, the opportunity. Um, Alicia Dahlstrom um, Davidson is her now, now her name. Um, Alicia's published around this question of, well, if we take this question and turn it on its head, how would we adjust the alpha uh, appropriately? Now, the biggest issue is going to be, how do we get that published? Because I, I'm going to tell you I'm using an alpha of 0.4. Well, how we, we're just not going to get it past the editors. So I think we need to be really clear about what questions we're asking, what effect size we're trying to find, and what the power in terms of our ability to, to detect that is. Yeah. Now, thanks very much. That was very interesting. But I, I was just wondering, can you tell me why you think society's tolerance to risk is, is quite high? And I'll, I'll give an example from the UK. A few years ago, we had an accident on the trains, and four people were killed, and many billions of pounds were spent trying to make sure it wouldn't happen again. At the same time, many thousands of people are killed on the roads, but we don't spend money reducing that risk. So we tolerate much higher levels of risk in some activities than others. Yep. So why do you think we tolerate a high level of risk here? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, in both of your instances, you've reflected on the potential personal impact based on human mortality morbidity. Um, most of these species are not going to cause that level of personal impact, but even more importantly, most people have no affinity or connection with the ocean. Um, if I go to the beach and I look at this, I don't see any species there, right? Therefore, out of sight, out of mind becomes quite a significant picture. By the way, this is a, this is a vessel that um, almost introduced Andaria to the Chatham Islands, this beautifully pristine place. And um, I, I suppose it's worthwhile saying that the, the fellow left on watch decided he wanted a beer more than he, um, more than he wanted to stay on the vessel. So um, he didn't shut all the stopcocks, let's say. And this vessel had Andaria on its hull. Now, the people in the Chathams who are fundamentally connected to the ocean clamored, you've got to do something. It's not acceptable because our livelihoods depend on the ability to, to manage that. So I think communicating value and actually sitting down with stakeholders, not to nudge them as much as to ascertain what they do value so that we can couch our arguments in, in a language that they understand is critical. Thank you for the talk, it was very nice. Um, at what point does a relic invader, is that relic invader no longer considered an, inv an invader? Uh, well, it's a good question. It's a philosophical one. I'm not sure it's a scientific one. Um, my, my personal feeling from um, an eco-evolutionary context would be the minute it begins to adapt and evolve with that, that natural community. The biggest issue that we're going to face is climate change rain shifts, are they, are they invaders? Should we be managing them? 
should we be facilitating them? It's becoming a much more difficult world in terms of managing this. It's easy to say that Australian barnacle that ended up in, in, uh, in the UK, you know, it doesn't belong here. It's really difficult to say that species that was in Queensland that's now in Tasmania, does that belong here? And so I think we're going to have some, some very interesting philosophical discussions in the near future. And to some extent, they're going to be affected by those, those national boundaries, um, that sense of iconic um, connection to certain species. Um, there are many non-natives, relic invaders, as you put them, um, that have iconic connections to both indigenous and, and modern cultures. And as a consequence, we accept them. Um, I try and avoid the use of the term naturalized, but many people use it, especially in New Zealand. I, see, I, I think it's more than a philosophical question because it all, it's reference to when we start our, our observations or have records of its presence. And as you pointed out, and as we all know, uh, the, our ability to characterize populations has increased exponentially, or at least greatly, in the last 20 years or 30 years. So what is our reference point? and as our reference point shifting. Hmm. Our reference point is shifting and it, and it will necessarily have to. Um, I mean, I think, you know, if I had to choose uh, our ability to understand, I'd probably say uh, 1400s, 1500s is, is pre-European expansion colonization and, and as a consequence of that, that really was the trigger <clears throat> for many of these, um, these bioregional connections. Um, but the fact is that we're now looking at changes from the beginning of the 19th century um, and we're ascertaining those. So I think we're going to be quite limited and restricted. It is necessary that we, we keep a focus on the future. I mean, what is here right now, we're not going to eliminate 2,500 species from, from the world oceans. We can, however, look at those and try and learn about where are they likely to arrive next and which ones of those are most important for us to manage. So I do agree that we need that level of specificity. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Dorothy Duncan from the University of Bergen. Uh, you mentioned there's a lot of these uh, latitudes where there's not a lot of observations. Um, what is the discussion about citizen science and the ability for other ships and other people around the world to start collecting, filling in databases, et cetera? Yeah, so, so citizen science is an interesting one and, and um, the literature is overwhelmingly positive around the opportunities for citizen science. From a biosecurity perspective, it's fantastic as an awareness raising campaign um, and specifically if, if you have a simple message to provide. For detecting the breadth of species, it becomes far more difficult. And a quick example, we, um, we had a student do a very simple analysis, very, you know, I, your, your uh, tossing the coin example the, uh, yesterday was, was really interesting. What he did was he went out um, in Tasmania, every boat ramp has four primary species, introduced species as images on the boat ramp, try and keep people aware. The idea is self-manage. If you have this on your boat, get rid of it, if you, you know, that kind of thing. And basically, he showed them images of the species and three others, um, two natives, one other non-native. And for these four iconic species, where literally, you know, a meter away, there was, there was an, an image and an identification, 40% accuracy. These are self-proclaimed, I'm knowledgeable about this. So, the, the, the citizen science element has the potential for positive, but we have to think about what the infrastructure requirement is for validating those, those detections. And I know a number of places around the world are considering it, and they're also considering the cost uh, associated with it. Yeah. Uh, fascinating talk, thank you very much. Um, I, I resonated with your comment about a colleague who you could mention a species to and you would have a one hour conversation with them. Uh, these people in themselves are a threatened species, uh, taxonomists, I mean taxonomies are dying 
dying science. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder how important that is to this particular field. Well, I mean, I think um, personally, understanding taxonomy, having the ability to, um, uh, to understand the history and, and to link that is absolutely critical. And yes, um, they're a dying breed, not necessarily a species. I, I think they do still um, occasionally produce off offspring with the rest of us. Um, <laughs> occasionally. Um, I, I, think, I think the biggest issue for us is to create the relevancy. I mean, you know, I'm, I've been in academia now for the last 10 years. Being able to train students in taxonomy, we have to do it by subterfuge. We cannot formally train them. We cannot literally get them into a, sit a situation where they, they learn taxonomy or systematics. We have to do it in other guises and foster them along. And I mean, when was the last time we had a, a truly um, taxonomically oriented PhD that then was published in a a location that was worthwhile. Um, you know, it's, it's a very difficult one for us to sell as we metricize our research activity and our research output. So part of this dialogue has to be the relevance and the application of that into the real world. And, um, and of course, you know, molecular taxonomy promises everything. It will not give us the answer around invasions. Um, so we, we have an equally difficult problem in terms of it has to be both. It has to be a shared relationship. And, uh, and one final comment, please, question from that end. So this may be more of a question uh, related to freshwater or to terrestrial systems, but uh, I can see it. Uh, being a potential for marine systems, and that is, uh, what about the aspect of introducing a species to counteract an invasive species that, we, that has no known uh, predator or no known uh, 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 natural um, uh, way to, to moderate that population coming into the system? Hmm. So, uh, I mean, we all know the legacy, um, and in Australia and New Zealand, we're <coughs> intimately familiar with the errors of biocontrol. Um, that said, there are some biological control options that exist. I think the first opportunity should be to look at the, the relevant natives. Um, if you do look at the, the absence of enemies in, in invaded regions, there's a lag time before the natives start to, to take advantage. Um, and that, in some ways, could be facilitated. Um, we've certainly, uh, in investigating the control of um, Asterius, the Northern Pacific Sea Star, we considered a number of native disease agents that might be um, developed and then deployed. Um, obviously, the immediate knee-jerk reaction is, we can do it. Yes, we can. We'll build a virus. Now, um, moderately frightening, and certainly in the Australian public, unacceptable. And so I think we also need to engage with the public stakeholders around where that acceptability level exists. In, uh, again, in the Australian context for marine, um, the, in, the intentional introduction of a predator to manage a, a problem um, was not an acceptable uh, element. Uh, thank you, Chad. We are, we are already running into coffee breaks, so Chad is around today and tomorrow here, so we, you can have a discussion with him in this building. But before we uh, go, go for coffee break, IC as always uh, acknowledges the key speakers, keynote speakers, and as usually, you will also get in a famous, famous history book plus, plus something else in a dark blue, blue package.